Do you want to hear a secret? So this kid wearing the Beetlejuice snake mask, that was me 34 years ago. I booked over 100 modeling gigs as a kid, but there was still some dude at Kenner Toys that said to himself, yeah, that Bernard kid, I like his attitude, just not really his face. But even still, I've been a Beetlejuice fan from the very beginning, both the movie and the cartoons. And my favorite part was always the sandworms. I liked how they were both scary, and yet when they get booped on the nose, they kind of whimper away like a dog. But for 34 years, I have always thought that they were actually snakes, not worms. So today I've enlisted two snake experts to help me decide once and for all, are Beetlejuice sandworms worms or snakes? My name's Dr. Chris Distel. I'm a professor of biology and field station director at Shriner University. My background is in herpetology, study of reptiles and amphibians, although I'm interested in a lot of different types of animals and ecological systems. My name's Dr. Jones, but call me Indiana. I'm named after the guy who is named after the dog. And like him, I'm terrified of snakes. A couple of other movies have great representations of something wormish. The Dune movies, the old ones and the new ones. Uh, Tremors in that franchise and some others. I grew up watching Tremors. I love Tremors. That thing, the monsters in Tremors are sort of worm-like. They're tubular. And in fact, they have internal mouth parts that appear to come out, maybe pharyngeal jaws, if you want to think of them that way. But they actually, on the outside, if you, if you zoom way out, those huge things are much more like modern aquatic insect larvae, many of which are no bigger than an inch or two. And their bodies are built just like that, but the filmmakers magnified that appearance, and boy, they made some great monsters. How closely related are worms and snakes? Worms and snakes are not closely related in the conventional sense. Worms don't really fall into one category, whereas traditionally snakes belong to a single lineage of reptiles. Uh, no species that today we, we call worms are traditionally considered reptiles, although for a long time, anything that was an animal that was rather tube-shaped might have been described as a worm. Since they're invertebrates, worms are stringy and fun, and definitely my favorite toys. I like flatworms the best. Dr. Distel, do you think the Beetlejuice sandworms are snakes? In Beetlejuice sandworms, we see a couple of features that right away make you think of snake. They're long, they're slender, they're legless, uh, and those things really stand out. They've got eyes, unlike, say, an earthworm, and they've got, when they open their mouth, they've got conish shaped teeth. Those things at first make, make you think, yeah, maybe this is sort of snakish. But there are some features about sandworms that are disqualifying from being snakes. For example, all snakes are reptiles and they have scales, like this corn snake, which is wrapped around my microphone cord. You can see the scales on the body of this corn snake. If you look at the sandworms in Beetlejuice, you'll see that their skin is entirely smooth, no scales at all. Another feature that snakes have that a lot of other groups like them don't have is that snakes lack eyelids. You could watch a snake all day, it's never going to blink. It can't. It doesn't have any eyelids to blink with. The sandworms in Beetlejuice can adjust their eyes a little bit. They squint, they scowl, they make intimidating looking faces. Uh, snakes, at least with their eyes, can't do anything like that. So from my point of view, and probably with a couple of other features, I would say the sandworms in Beetlejuice are not snakes. You forgot the most defining characteristic. <coughs> Indiana is scared to death of snakes. Not all cats are scared. I'm totally cool with snakes. But Indy is a scaredy cat. This is a totally rational fear. There's a reason they call snakes danger noodles. Wait, this is a sandworm? This isn't scary. I'm not scared of this at all. Boop. Even when it's raised up to attack, still not scary. Totally, 100%, sandworms are not snakes. A lot of cats are scared of cucumbers. 
Would you consider cucumbers to be a kind of snake? So taxonomy is the study of naming and classifying different kinds of organisms. And it really is equal parts labeling and understanding anatomical and genetic relationships. A lot of people are familiar with some of the, what we call binomial nomenclature, or the, the two named Latin name system that Linnaeus came up with. He was so invested in this, you know, Linnaeus uh, was not actually born Linnaeus. He was born Carl von Linné. But when he came up with this system, he Latinized his own name to Carolus Linnaeus. And many people are familiar with these, these two-part names for humans like Homo sapiens or Tyrannosaurus rex. One of the troubling parts of any labeling system is that the people give the labels, not the, uh, not the other way around. The, 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 the biology informs the labels for us, we don't inform the biology. The cat might have a, a search image in mind to watch out for that something sort of tubular sneaking up on it is to be avoided, but that doesn't necessarily make it a snake. And if you asked any herpetologist who's serious about taxonomy, if a cucumber is a snake, they would undoubtedly tell you no. Maybe we agree to disagree on that one. This next quote was written by Chicago architect Lewis Sullivan in 1896 in his publication, The Tall Office Building Artistically Considered. And he wrote this because he found all of the junior architects who had just graduated from school to be obnoxious, right? They were designing 16-story office buildings as if they were 16 different one-story buildings stacked on top of each other, every one with a completely different style, just to try to like show off their architectural chops, just to, to try to prove themselves. And now as an engineer, we have an expression, reverse engineering, which is essentially like saying, engineers are gonna steal your stuff and consider it our own. I am going to borrow this thought of form follows function from the architects and consider what is the function of the sandworm in these movies? What's its purpose? And if we know why it's in the film, we might be able to better understand what form it has taken. Now, my favorite 2000s comedy has to be Kenny vs. Spenny. This show laid the groundwork for MTV's Jackass, and that paved the groundwork for all of the YouTube prank channels that we all hate so much today. Indy, that's my sushi. It's just a prank, bro. If you've never heard of Kenny vs. Spenny, most episodes are on YouTube today, so look up and watch who can be tied to a goat the longest. Just trust me, you'll thank me later. In the episode, first one to touch the ground loses. Spenny found himself trapped in a swing, and we see Kenny dump an eel into a little kitty swimming pool underneath him. In this way, the eel is acting as a fence. It's a trap to keep Spenny in place. Do you know what that sound is, Highness? Those are the shrieking eels. Worst impression ever. In The Princess Bride, one of the greatest movies of all time, there's a scene where Andre the Giant and Inconceivable and that guy whose name I don't know because he never in the whole movie ever introduces himself by name to anyone, they don't even have to tie up the princess because where's she gonna go? When she tries to escape, the eels are there, which force her to come back to the boat. They're acting as a fence. If she leaves her permitted space, she gets eaten by the eels. Maybe I'm crazy, but I'm starting to see a connection here. That's exactly the functional purpose of Neptune's sandworms. Well, I think it's an interesting question about whether sandworms could be considered eels. The first thing you might notice is that they live in the sand and uh, eels live in the water. But apart from that behavioral distinction, eels have smooth skin, they have uh, fins, which we see in the sandworm, and one of the really interesting things I, I see in the sandworms is the internal head that comes out of the mouth of the, of the outer, I don't know what you want to call it, the outer sleeve of the organism. A group of eels has what are called pharyngeal jaws, you may have seen this in moray eels. They have a, a movable set of jaws inside their throat that they can rock forward and grasp on to prey with. So they have the teeth we can see when they're breathing, when they're pumping water into their mouth and over their gills, but they can actually hold on to their prey with an additional set of teeth 
attached to essentially jaws in their throat. So to me, that makes a pretty good case for eels. That was brilliant, but completely wrong. Sandworms are gross. Eels are delicious, and my belly is never wrong. Any other ideas? So another group of, uh, of species that you might not immediately think about when you think about worms or snakes or sandworms is salamanders. They have this sort of traditional vertebrate shaped body. They've got a head at one end, four limbs, and a long tail. But there are a couple groups of salamanders that have a very eel-like shape. In fact, they're often confused with eels. And one of those I want to direct your attention to is the amphiumas. Amphiumas do have four legs, although they're so tiny, they're almost impossible to see. Amphiumas can grow to large size. Some of these suckers can be over three feet long. They have big teeth and big jaws with a powerful bite. So at least on the outside, until that inner mouth comes out, I would say a sandworm looks a whole lot like an amphiuma. Uh, it's got diminutive eyes and things like that. But amphiumas don't have the movable pharyngeal jaws that you see in the moray eels. But salamanders are tiny. Sandworms are humongous. If they were on Earth, wouldn't they be dinosaurs? The average size of a dinosaur was about the size of a modern turkey. There were a lot of small dinosaurs to average out the, the really big ones. There don't seem to be any true dinosaurs that are enormous, legless, scaleless, finned organisms. So I'm not sure that sandworms would really fit in with dinosaurs. So full circle, we're all the way back to worms. The name worm can mean almost anything. When people have ascribed the name worm to a species of one kind or another, very often that has just been a tube-shaped organism that doesn't have another name. So actually, if we look at some of the major groups of worms that you might have learned about in grade school or high school, we could look at like the flat worms and the round worms and the segmented worms. Round worms are more closely related to insects than they are to earthworms. They just happen to have a similar outward facing body plan. So worm at WYRM shows up in a lot of accounts uh, in English and pre-English lore. Uh, whether those accounts are truly uh, supernatural or they are really accounts of something that someone has observed in nature, we do see the term coming up in, in sort of factual accounts as well as creative fiction. It means different things. Some uh, translations of the Old Testament or the, the Hebrew scriptures of Genesis describe the so-called snake in the garden as a worm that has been translated in English most often to snake, although the Bible has many translations. We also see that that, that word worm, W-Y-R-M, shows up in some of the earliest writings of Beowulf, the, the epic Beowulf. And that is to describe uh, Beowulf's last monster opponent, which is a dragon, that this worm arises and is eventually ready for battle. So that is meant to be some sort of serpentine thing. Yeah, just like my shiny Gyarados that made me the coolest dude of 2017. Those dragons, snakish things, I think necessarily have an enigma enigmatic component. They are dangerous, they are mysterious, there are things we don't quite understand about them. Which makes sense when you think about snakes and some other reptiles. They like to hide under things. Most often if people get close to them, they take on a defensive pose. Cobra might, you know, puff out its, its hood or a, a rattlesnake might shake its tail. And some of them are in fact dangerous. They have an incredible bite, some of them being venomous. Venom, burns, large lizards and alligators can have awful breath because of the rotting things they eat. This might be over time through oral tradition magnified into something like steam or smoke coming out of the mouth and, and terrible gases and maybe flames. And suddenly we've got stories of dragons with a few, a few embellishments along the way. So far in the fossil record, there's no evidence of what most modern folks consider dragons. Certainly no giant winged reptiles with huge teeth that are able to breathe fire. 
However, I think that WIRM, W-Y-R-M, is one of the most fascinating areas of reptile engagement because people like things that are dangerous and big and mysterious. And dinosaurs certainly fall into that category. And a lot of modern reptiles can fall into that category. So it's totally reasonable to talk about dragons as a neat thing that we might want to explore, engage with, cast into our movies. And in that sense, maybe the Beetlejuice sandworm is a dragon. Final answer time, what are sandworms? If I saw a sandworm and was able to investigate it, I think that it shares the most in common with modern eels. The Maitlands are only allowed to haunt their house. If they try to leave, the sandworms will get them. Just like the shrieking eels in The Princess Bride. So if the purpose of the creature is to act as a fence to keep the characters contained, then its form should be that of an eel. If worms make the best toys, then sandworms are clearly worms. If the name worm can apply to everything from a tiny parasite to a earthworm to a dragon, then there's got to be room in there for sandworms. What's the name of this channel? Explained by cats. Exactly. Ty goes to the cats. Sandworms are worms. Thank you so much for watching. The kitties put in a ton of hard work to make these. So if you like engineering math and science applied to current events and pop culture, go ahead and subscribe so you can see each new video as they come out.